in our next video, we are going to continue on with our kind of intro to ex experimental design. We got some new terms, um, and really this will be a lot of kind of review from the previous video. Now, medical experiments have some differences over doing just normal, non-medical experiments. So we're going to talk about an example and how this is going to be maybe slightly different than the way that we do maybe a non-medical experiment. So let's test out a new headache medication on 500 volunteers suffering from frequent headaches. Now, our 500 volunteers, we wouldn't necessarily call them our experimental units, though they are our experimental units, but whenever our experimental units are people, we get to call those experimental units our subjects. So our subjects are our 500 volunteers. Now let's take a look back at what a factor was and what levels were in an experiment. So in this experiment, we have really just one factor and we are just testing or we're using as treatments medications. Now, there could be other factors in this particular experiment, but really to keep the experiment as simple as possible, one factor is ideal. The more factors you have, the more complicated the experiment becomes. So what else could we have used as a factor besides medication? We could have looked at, um, let's say, temperature. People that get frequent headaches, it could be temperatures affect them, that if it gets too hot or if it gets too cold, then all of a sudden that triggers you know, a migraine, for instance. So in this one, we are only testing. We are only specifically looking at specific medications here. Now, there are three levels, and the levels are kind of like the, the variations of our factor specifically. So we're going to be looking at three variations of medication. We're going to be looking at, number one, a new type of uh, headache medication. We're also going to be using the old medication, because if we see that the new medication is effective, is it really more effective than what was currently on the market with the old medication? You know, is the new, in fact, better than the old, or is the new just as good as the old? And then, you know, what purpose really is there of coming out with a new medication if it works just as well as the old medication? And then we're also going to have a third level. We're going to have a placebo. And the placebo is really going to give us a a baseline, if you will. Now, the old medication also gives us a particular baseline to compare the new medication to, but we might also see uh, with a placebo what effect really having no medication is going to do for us. So overall, there's three treatments. And yes, the three total treatments do represent the different levels of our one factor of medication. So the total treatments, the three total treatments are there's new medication, there's the old medication, and then there's a placebo medication. Um, and you might say, well, what exactly does the placebo consist of? Well, the placebo is going to be, it's still going to represent a pill because we have to make people think they are taking a medication. So we're not just going to say, hey, you get nothing. And then people are going to go, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, you're going to give me no medicine? Obviously, my headache's not going to go away all by itself. So if we give them something that makes them believe that they are taking medication, then that medicine, that quote-unquote medicine that we give them, really has no actual medication in it. But the people believe that they are taking uh, some sort of actual treatment. A placebo is a what we call a fake or a dummy treatment. Uh, in terms of a, a medical experiment, it may also be known as a sugar pill. Like basically a placebo pill looks like a pill. Um, you couldn't tell any difference between a fake pill and let's say the pill that had the new medication in it or the old medication. They all look identical. But there's really no active ingredient in a placebo. Okay, so literally it's just, I mean, I don't know what other things they put in pills to fill up space, but basically there's no real medicine in a placebo. Now, what seems weird, and I have a little video snippet that I'm going to show you after this, uh, but there's something called the placebo effect. And the placebo effect is when a placebo, when just a regular 
not medically enhanced pill produces positive results when really we wouldn't have expected anything. So there have been times, many times actually, in different experiments where um, subjects were given a placebo, a, a sugar pill, if you will, and whatever they were trying to alleviate in this medical experiment, people actually got better when they took not medicine. And so the placebo effect is this real idea of how the power of positive thinking can really produce positive effects for your body, um, that your body really can produce its own medicine if you think that you took actual medicine. Now, on the flip side, there's something called the nocebo effect. And this is where you get into um, TV commercials or ads that'll say like, uh, for people that took this medication, they may have suffered, and then they give you this whole list of negative side effects that maybe these people experienced. And you know, like nausea, upset stomach, diarrhea, death, and you're like, holy crap, do I really want to take this if it potentially kills people? Um, but you know, some people just happen to die during that medical experiment. Was it necessarily the medication that caused the person to die? Well, hopefully not. Hopefully it was some other reason. Uh, that they died. But they still have to report, if someone died during that medical experiment, they have to list that as a possible side effect, regardless if it really contributed or not. Hopefully it didn't. So the nocebo effect is when a placebo produces a negative result, uh, whenever we really expected nothing to happen, right? Because a placebo doesn't really have real medicine in it. So now I'm going to show you a quick little snippet here um, of a video that I really, really enjoyed that really brings together the placebo and the placebo effect. Now you've all heard of the placebo effect before, when something with no known therapeutic value can actually make people feel better. It's a great trick our minds play on us, that by believing and expecting something to work, it actually does. But what's weird is that the strength of the effect can differ for some really strange reasons. For example, the same placebo can treat pain half as well as aspirin, while at the same time treating pain half as well as morphine. Morphine's a much more powerful painkiller, but a placebo is half as effective as both? Saying a placebo will reduce pain, reduces pain. But saying that the same placebo will increase pain, increases pain. Believing that a placebo will make you feel better, will make you feel better. Believing that it won't, has the opposite effect. Now, placebos aren't just pills. They can be creams, injections, surgeries, or drinks. You can even get placebo buttons. They don't actually do anything, but they sure as hell make you feel like you're in control. But not all placebos are equal. The effect of the placebo is bigger when the pill itself is bigger. Or if you have two instead of one. Or two once a day instead of one twice a day. And a capsule will usually beat a pill. And a syringe will usually beat a capsule and anything with a big ass science machine can outperform any of them. A plain pill works worse than a branded one. A discounted pill works worse than a pricey one. And even a pill in a plain box does worse than one that's all shiny and shit. Placebos that are blue work best as downers, and placebos that are red are better as uppers. Studies have shown that people who take their meds on a regular basis are less likely to die than those that don't. Even if those meds are all placebos. You can even get addicted to placebos. In one study, a group of women took placebos for more than five years. 40% of them suffered withdrawals afterwards. In fact, the effect of placebos can be so strong that some people want them banned from sports. But I mean, how would you even test for that? Placebos don't even seem to work from place to place. For example, in Germany, using a placebo to treat ulcers works better than anywhere else in Europe. But using a placebo that treats hypertension doesn't work nearly as well as it does for its neighbors. Now, remember that all of this is about comparing things that both have nothing medically effective in them, which goes to show that a placebo isn't about what's in it, but about the beliefs that we load onto it. Our minds create the medicine, and that is pretty freaking weird.
Wasn't that a great video? I agree. Now, we also need to consider how the medication will be administered in a medical experiment. And so we have this term called single-blinded versus double-blinded. And in a single-blinded experiment, the patients do not know which treatment they are receiving. They don't know if they're getting the actual real medication or if they're receiving a placebo. And if you told a patient that they were getting the placebo, then, you know, maybe they've already gotten their mindset like, well, great, I'm getting this fake sugar pill. I'm going to take it. I'm not going to get any better. And... Yeah, I mean, there's there's nothing there, right? But we just talked about there's this idea called the placebo effect where maybe they do get better and we want to give them that opportunity that maybe, just maybe, by crazy happenstance with the placebo effect, they do get better. Now, to counter the single-blinded, the double-blinded is where the patients and the experimenter, the person handing out the pills, neither one of those people know what uh, is the real pill and which one's the placebo pill? And then you might be wondering, well, if the person handing out the pill doesn't know if it's the real deal or the placebo and the patients don't know what they're receiving, does somebody know who's getting what? And yeah, there is kind of like a third party person that's basically saying, okay, uh, Mr. Experimenter, you give this pill to patient one, then give this pill to patient two. So somebody is keeping track here. But the person giving out the medication really has no idea if they're handing out a real medication or a placebo medication. So ideally, ideally, obviously we want experiments to be double-blinded, okay? And you might go, well, what's the big difference here? Um, if an experiment is double-blinded, you know, there could be some way, like, if we were really doing, like, let's say, a cancer medical experiment, and we were testing to see if a certain medication um, maybe shrunk or reduced the amount of cancer, that it slows down the spread or something. Um, if an experimenter knew that they were giving a cancer patient the placebo, you know, they'd be like, oh, you know, here's here's your medicine. You know, it's probably not going to do much. But um... And the patient's like, what? What'd you say? Like, oh, nothing. I'm... Just really sorry, I got to give you this medication. Well, that's not really keeping everything clear and transparent, okay? So really in those situations, we want a double blind where an experimenter just goes, here's your pill, and they're not giving any indication whether the patient is receiving the real medication or a placebo medication. All right, now our response variable for this experiment is I would just call it effectiveness, if you will. And we can kind of think of effectiveness in two different ways. Either we are eliminating headaches, um, or maybe we could also be measuring the amount of time that it took to alleviate the pain from the headache, right? So we may not necessarily get rid of it altogether, but, um, you know, are we, are we making it better, essentially? Is it effective in some way if it doesn't eliminate it? Now, our key principles to experimental designs. We always want to try to have these three things in check. Number one, random assignment. Number two, replication. And number three, control. And we're going to talk about what each of these things really means in an experiment. So number one, random assignment. This is going to allow impartial chance to assign subjects to our treatment groups that create similar groupings. We're not going to allow people to, you know, really volunteer for the real medication versus people who are like, yeah, I'll sign up for this experiment only if I get to take the placebo. But then those groups of people may or may not be similar to each other. And so then if we see differences between our two groups where we let them decide which treatment group they're going to be in, we don't know if there was some difference between the people or if there was some difference between the actual treatments that we gave those people. So this helps to naturally reduce any effects from lurking or confounding variables. We want our treatment groups, however many there are, two, three, four, etc., cetera, uh, to really be as similar as possible. And we're just going to allow randomness to decide who's going to be in which groups. Number two, replication. We want to use enough experimental units or subjects in each treatment group to show that differences in the response variable was not by chance alone. 
And all I mean by this is, in the example that we've been talking about, we said we would take 500 subjects. And so if we split them up, and if we did, let's say, just the, the two-level approach, where we gave um, half of the people, 250 people, the real medication, and the other 250 people, the placebo medication, having 250 people take each treatment, that's a lot of subjects for each of our treatment groups. And so we might have some people not respond to the new medication, uh, but we might have some people that do respond to the medication. So we just want to have enough people be in both or in all your treatment groups um, to really show that it wasn't just by chance alone. Um, and so, you know, it wouldn't make much sense to have, let's say, you know, five people take the real medication and five people take the placebo. Um, because if, I don't know, let's say four out of five people that took the real medication saw positive results and two out of five people in the placebo group saw positive results, which is weird because we would have expected them to be zero out of five saw positive results. Um, we don't really have a whole lot of data to work with there. So the idea of you want to have big enough sample sizes um, in your treatment groups is the main idea here. More is better. And then the third uh, key principle is control. And we've been talking about this idea of control. We need to have a baseline group. And we want to try to control for um, lurking or confounding variables that may kind of mix up or may cause some uh, differences that we wouldn't have normally seen. And so our lurking variables, just to remind you, were any unknown variables that we weren't really thinking about that may, um, may make our response variable have some bias in it. Um, versus confounding variables where those were variables that we were trying to um, reduce or eliminate the effects of. Like those were definitely ones where we were like, hey, you know what? We think this might be an issue. Let's try to control for this particular confounding variable. So any differences in our response variable can then be primarily attributed to the differences in our treatments. Now, we're already to the you do. Now, this is, again, split up into multiple parts here, but I've got an example. A pet pharmaceutical company wants to test two new heartworm treatments for dogs. They will randomly assign one of the two new treatments to dogs that have been recently diagnosed with heartworms until 50 dogs are assigned uh, to each of the two treatments. So, in general, part one, how many experimental units are there? Part two, how many factors are there? Part three, how many levels are there? Number four, should a control group be used and why? And number five, does the experiment need to be single-blinded? Does it need to be double-blinded? Think about who your subjects are in this experiment. And then the last two, should a placebo be used? And discuss why or why not. And the last one, to whom do the results of the study apply? And those are the seven that we'll talk about the next day in class. Good luck.